Hello and welcome back to the Aesthetic Dialogues. In this series, I am interviewing various aesthetic experts across our country who have been into practice since last 50 to 20 years. So the guest for uh, the today's episode is Dr. Reema Arora today. And she is an international trainer for fillers and Botox. She has trained over 2,500 dermatologists and plastic surgeons over the last 18 years. She is a prominent key opinion leader for a few major names of the industry. Dr. Reema Arora is extremely skilled in carrying out high precision non-surgical procedures like nose shaping, enhancing thin lips, elongating the chin, jawline definition, cheek enhancement, etc. Dr. Reema is also the founder of the Face Clinic, which offers the finest aesthetic and smartly aging treatments using the latest techniques. Under the guidance of the best rejuvenation expert, an ethical blend of skill and technology is employed at the Face Clinic to deliver the highest level of skincare service and treatment standards. She also has many publications to her name and has been a faculty to many national and international aesthetic conferences like IMCAS Paris, Dermacon, ASICON, etc. So without any further delay, let's get into this. Hi, Dr. Rima. Welcome to the Aesthetic Dialogues. And I am so happy to share this platform with you and gain your insights. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And it's so wonderful to see you after a long time, even though it's virtual, but we haven't met in a long time. Yeah, yeah. So the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, the first I remember meeting you was like long, dear. it was my first training with Allergan, you know, that was the time I met you. So uh, it's been long since then. Yes. So are you ready for your questions? Yeah, sure. Whatever you wish to ask. <laughs> So now my first question is that um, uh, like uh, you've had an elaborate and expanse career over many years and uh, you started when very few people were acquainted with the term medical facial aesthetics. So how did you, uh, you know, get started? Your, how did you start your journey at that time? So this is really interesting because I feel that it's sort of like an individual's destiny that takes you there. So it was way back in 2006 when I started working with Allergan. And my role was I was the medical head for uh, Allergan and I was involved with meeting a lot of doctors, doing a lot of trainings. And in all those interactions, I you know, it was really stimulating and it really, you know, motivated me to go into aesthetics. And there was a lot of learning in different countries like um, Singapore, Korea, and Australia, and all that learnings put together. I was really ignited to do something in facial aesthetics. And um, so here I am since 2006, this journey started. Um, and I love mixing the science with the art and giving innovative solutions for facial aesthetics. So I love it. So that is the injectables uh, was something that made a turning point in your career, basically. Definitely, because I, uh, you know, I was totally into a career of pediatrics. And then because we were dealing with spasticities, and that's how I got involved with Allegan. Okay. And I'll change after that. Change after that. <laughs> Great, wonderful. So now uh, there is a lot of confusion that exists uh, in the med medical facial aesthetic space. Uh, also, the practitioners are uh, practicing predominantly what they, uh, you know, resonate with the most. You know, some are more into injectables, some are more into uh, the laser and light devices. So uh, some are predominantly, you know, into uh, their peelings and body resurfacing zone. So choosing a right practitioner is a very big challenge uh, for someone who wants to pursue these treatments. So yeah. if one has to design a flow chart on how to choose the most appropriate practitioner for themselves, so what, it, what would the sequence be like? So that's an interesting question because sometimes um, when a, a patient walks in, you can understand that they're in the dilemma because there are many options available. And I feel if I were in their place, a best, the best way to start is to first understand what the doctor's education is, what sort of certifications they have, 
what um, you know qualifications are there how many years of experience do they have that's a good way to start definitely going uh, and reading their review seeing what other patients have to say about them can be nice and um, definitely i suggest that you can you can book a consultation with the doctor see how your uh, assessment is done and then what is your rapport that you've built with uh, the consultation definitely you'll understand if you're comfortable or not with them uh, understand where they're practicing and uh, what sort of modalities they use and in the conversation you can understand how uh, good they are with the techniques and what sort of innovation they're using since facial aesthetics is so fast in progress yeah. i feel we all have to keep ourselves up to pace and um, whenever you're deciding on a treatment you should ensure that the practitioner is actually constantly educating themselves and has gained an expertise in whatever field they wish to go by you know even if it's to do a hair removal laser once they do a consultation they can understand how much the doctor knows and how much they're open to discuss um definitely if they feel that they're getting pushed to do a treatment then that's probably not the best place to be the best it's very true right so wow that's a wonderful answer now uh, let's reverse the question you know if the doctor has to choose the right uh, patient for themselves you know uh, what are the red flags that you would see in a person you know uh, because there are certain people who are you resonate with you and your technology is best and then there are certain who don't so is it a way to find out is there a way to find out or uh, i mean through experience if you have that's uh even till today it's a very you know slippery ground because often you get in a catch 22 should i be treating this patient or should i just you know let them go um i've always told during all my training sessions with all physicians is that medical aesthetics is as serious a specialty as anything else we practice so it's very important to start at the beginning wherein you're doing your history taking understanding what's the concern of the patient mm. secondly understanding what uh, is their motivation why are they in your clinic and then um, whether you would be able to deliver what they are expecting if you feel that their expectations are there and you're here it's it's better to you know let them go and tell them that you know you're not in the right place mm. so discuss the treatment also discuss what are the possible complications that may happen with the treatment as a physician we should definitely discuss it with the patient uh give them an insight of the ethics behind every treatment like there is only a certain extent and you shouldn't bend so you should be very clear that this is what is ethically possible and we cannot do other things for you also understand whether they are understanding the post care the possibility of a complication mm -hmm. that they need to follow up with you and that it's an ongoing process it's not like bang everything is just going to one go shot. Away. it's not a one shot thing it's a like a process yeah totally so because people are having so much knowledge out there and mm -hmm. some of it is half cooked so people yeah. are reading social media or they're doing tiktok or they're doing sometimes google can be quite uh, irritation for the doctor because the patient will come across as if they have read everything and they know everything yes. and if i feel that uh, you know in my personal opinion if i feel that i'm not able to get my point across to them mm -hmm. then i usually defer the treatment uh, or i straight away say no that i don't think i'm the right doctor for you uh, so it, it's not only for you know if, if something comes for clinical dermatology i'll tell them i'm not the right doctor for you you right. need to see another person or uh, similarly if somebody's got really big lips and they want more product i will mm -hmm. say sorry i am not the right person yeah. um, i would counsel them and then if they don't understand i would just you know politely say um, it's not mm -hmm. a good idea so, and the biggest red flag for me is if they come into my clinic and they talk about my colleagues and they're saying things which are not acceptable mm -hmm. or they are um, sort of criticizing or commenting too much on the work on a colleague of mine then i know there are strong red flags and they're not going to be easy to treat yeah and that is something very common because you know uh, they try to 
uh, you know, gain your confidence and then bargain on that later. Yes. Yeah. I remember um, in a conference when I was attending with Dr. Arthur Swift, he had this slide uh, where they show that the patient is hypnotizing the doctor and say, fill my lines, fill my lines, fill my yeah. lines. And the doctor <laughs> sort of gets carried away because they're like so overwhelmed yeah. by the pressure of the patient. Right. Um, I think that's the main thing that you have to understand that at the end of the day, you're the doctor. And if you feel you cannot give a result or they're not the ideal candidates, you should just say no. Yeah, so this saying no component has been, you know, constantly resurfacing in all my interviews with the aesthetic practitioners. That has yes. been a really because we're in a very vulnerable time, you know, because yes. there's so much happening. It's it's a very dynamic field. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of options. So to all my fellow doctors who practice aesthetics, I feel that there are enough and more patients for all of us. You yeah. needn't. Um, say yes because you have the pressure that I'm going to lose this patient. Yeah. Because uh, in the long run, it's only going to be difficult for you. Difficult, definitely. Yeah. That's what we have to foresee at the, that yeah. time. Yes. And I think it comes with time and maturity, the more right. experience you have. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Wow. Now, most of the procedures that we do are mostly pertaining to the women. Uh, especially in the age group where they are, you know, going through multiple uh, dimensions of changes in their life, you know, they're, they are in the perimenopausal or menopausal age group and their skin is going through multitude of changes and their body is going through multitude of changes. So uh, how do these changes alter the treatment plans uh, that you design for them? Well, so now this is very close to my heart because that's where I am in my <laughs> life. So I can understand that uh, what, bone, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what we're going through. Yeah. Um, there are many dimensions to this age group. One is, of course, they have more time on hand. Their children are usually settled. Um, financially, they're okay. So they have some time to spend and some they have some budget to spend on themselves. At the same time, they have a lot of challenges. So their skin is not what it used to be. Pigmentation is a big issue. Suddenly, a very oily skin is becoming dry. So as per their hormonal changes, we have to definitely modify treatments. Um, I try to avoid a lot of very heat-related therapies because they're already going through the hot flashes and not too much of aggressive lasers because pigmentation can get worse during menopause. I encourage more of um, relaxation therapies, a lot of uh, body contouring because suddenly you're bulging from areas yeah. which you weren't <laughs> before um, and giving them a very long-term sort of regime. It's really gratifying because they are um, they start opening up as, as your patient and uh, somewhere we are all losing that confidence that now I'm going towards the other side of the spectrum. <laughs> These treatments actually really help to build their confidence and it makes me very happy. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's a journey. Every woman has to be told that menopause is not just one time. Right. It's a journey and you have to slowly embrace it. Mm -hmm. And I tell all my menopausal patients or perimenopausal is enjoy your menopause. Yeah. There's so many good things about it. About you know, that you don't have to worry about what you have to wear. You don't have... Uh, to worry about contraception you don't have to worry about um, you know I can't wear white today or I have to, to carry my sanitary pad all the time right. there's a lot of good things also things also um, yes yeah and uh, because people's expectations from how you look come down even a little makes you look really stunning so yeah <laughs> wonderful that's great uh, also one thing uh, which I wanted to ask myself was that uh, uh, usually these women have uh, this issue of puffiness, facial puffiness. Yes. So how do you design the facial fillers, uh, keeping that aspect in consideration? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. You know, um, one thing is that I start combining a little bit of energy based, like doing an ul therapy or a haifu to debulk okay. the face. I definitely uh, add on a lot of lymphatic drainage massages to their treatments in the face, which yes. is relaxation as well as it does help to reduce the edema. 
uh, I put them through the lymphatic drainage massages also. And I bring down the amount of filler that I'm doing before. Right. One rule I've really uh, seen works very well is that the central phase I start omitting because anywhere there's more puffiness around the eye yeah. and yeah. the area. So I work more on lateral, lateral lifting aspect. and giving them uh, stronger jaw lines and a better chin rather yeah. than focusing on their cheeks. Sure. That works well. Um, and so if I were doing 4 ml for that woman, I would bring it down to 2. I do very minimalistic and yeah. very natural. So nobody knows, but they look really fantastic. So. Wonderful. Lovely answer. <laughs> now, uh, we have individuals uh, opting for Botox from, you know, say early 20s till late 40s and 50s. So what is the age group that you have observed adapts well to Botox treatments? And what could be the possible reason for it? It's really interesting the way our uh, industry is progressing. We have more people coming in their 20s. Sometimes even the late teenage adolescents want to get stuff done. Um, I think 20 to 40 is most responsive to Botox. Uh, in the uh, mid to late 20s, they're a little more preventative or they want to reshape. So that's great because they're aware much more. And I think they're really smart. They know that they, if they start now, they will age better. So yeah, the 20s to 40s are the best. In the 35, 40, because they have more elasticity of their skin, yes. their muscles are uh, more stronger, they get brilliant results. And they don't have much of the static lines. They're mm -hmm. more the dynamic lines. Yeah. So 20 to 40 is the age group where I feel they do the best with just both the Changes are still progressing. They haven't yet settled down. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, they're very smart because they're, uh, you know, what, what we call into preventive aging which is, and I like this generation because they're very open and they're okay to accept. Yeah. And sometimes they even come into the clinic and say, doctor, I want Botox because I don't want to get permanent frown lines. My mom has them yeah. or my aunt has them and mm -hmm. I don't yeah. want them. So, Also, I feel that they are fast decision makers, you know, because yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they decide yes. immediately. Yeah, they, I think they, the other thing is they have more uh, disposable income and I think uh, in, in the the times when there was only a one child. So there's one ch a child or two child children in the family. So they have more money to do stuff as compared to older times where it was a larger family. So, right. you know, people are conservative on spending on themselves. So they're very self-aware and they understand that um, if they spend on themselves now, they're buying a lot of time for the later. So that's great. Great. Uh, so how would you say that aesthetics is an investment? You know, how do you come across with this point in your consultations? Yeah, so post-COVID, it's become quite easy because really people have realized that um, finally your body and you are what is actually yours. Everything else is very dynamic. And the more you're taking care of yourself now, you can fight, you know, disease or illness. Um, I think... What I do is I tell them about how my I myself invest in myself, in my skin. And um, compared to 10 years before to now, I feel my skin is doing much better. So that's an investment. And giving examples of how women who take care of themselves versus the ones who don't at the same age look quite different. How it impacts their personal life or their professional opportunities. Because it gives a lot of self-confidence, the way you look. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, even now, the first impression is how you see a person. Yeah. Even if it doesn't change a lot in the way you appear, I think it really works on your confidence. So I feel that it's a great investment for the future for anybody. Right. And um, uh, like uh, nowadays, there's a very big misconception that people have is that if they stop taking treatments, uh, they might start looking much older. So... Um, how is it that you manage this kind of misconceptions? Yeah, it's okay to have misconceptions. I feel when we have those discussions, in fact, it helps to build a nice rapport with your patient. Um, and I'm very open to talk about all the misconceptions. What they need to understand is that the whatever face treatments or aesthetic treatments we do, one, we will continue to age. So that doesn't stop. We need to educate them that... Um, Aesthetic treatments is only a part of how you're going to age. Your skincare is as important. 
aesthetic treatments are buying you time because yeah they're actually I, like for botox i tell them that your you know your muscles have gone on a holiday they will come back after four months so they'll be more fresh than where you started Right. And similarly, all the treatments we do for face treatments or fillers, we're actually promoting collagen neogenesis. So the quality of the skin over time is actually going to improve. Yeah. And then I also educate them. I've got two types of patients. So there are some who are coming because there's a wedding in the family or it's their 50th birthday or 25th wedding anniversary. And they have saved up that money to do something fantastic for themselves. And then there's a group who's the regular patient. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the person who's like saved up and comes only once a year still looks much better to when they came the first time to the second or third time that they come. So there is definitely some longevity that you're giving your skin. Yeah. So that's a myth if you think that it's going to make you age worse. So and that your analogy is very good. Your muscles have gone on a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I usually say that it's like putting a pause button on your aging, you know, yes. till you're taking these treatments. And once you stop them, the pause button is off. So something like that. Yeah, another interesting thing I heard from Dr. K.M. Kapoor at one of the conferences is he said that between the ages of 45 and 50, there comes this one year where you suddenly age more. And it happens to everybody. Yes, so yes. we should be open that there will be, like if suddenly there's a stress in a family or you've gone through some illness, it will impact your skin also. Mm -hmm. And we have to just, you know, uh, accept it accept it's, it the changes I mean, are going to be coming to. yeah we, uh, we have to embrace those changes also yeah exactly and uh, any no aesthetic treatments guarantees the way I mean you'll keep looking the way you are looking right yeah. now yeah, yeah exactly so it's not surgery we are just going to be doing some tweaking right so uh, now um, so you have such uh, lovely skin and uh, <laughs> no sagging and a very good jawline. So what is your favorite treatment that you keep getting done regularly if you want to disclose? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll very happily share. So definitely I have a good skincare regime in place, which I wouldn't have had unless I was in this uh, field. Um, I love doing um, face treatments, which are usually a combination of a laser and some infusions, maybe once a month I do that. And definitely Botox filler once a year. So I don't do a lot of it, but once a year, yes, because I feel that it that really helps with quality of skin and helps with the lifting. Right. Yeah, and okay. That's all. Great. So we know your secret mm -hmm. recipe now. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's a combination of both injectable and energy-based devices. It's treatment and skincare, all three put together. Yeah. Right. So that works best. Okay, now uh, being a medical aesthetic practitioner, what is the one good habit and one, uh, not a bad habit, but one habit that you, you know, have acquired? Uh, yes. Over the years. <laughs> you, I think you understand what I mean to say. <laughs> yes. So good is yes. Like I said, skin, at least I have a skincare regime. So however tired I am at night, at least I will put something even if it's not all the steps, but yes, sunscreen I've started using, which mm -hmm. I wouldn't have probably if I, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise I was the most happy-go-lucky person. Um, and bad, I don't know bad, but it's I become very critical because we have you know. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think this is due. That is due. So uh, over the years, you know, balancing what you have and what you need to accept. Yeah. has been what I what is my mantra to stay sane is okay I'm happy because I have all this there's so much that I don't have yeah. but yeah let's accept that I'm x number of years old so that's okay so that's that balance is what is yeah very important right great now one most overrated and most underrated treatment in medical facial aesthetics uh, as of today for me definitely underrated is microneedling Okay. I feel it's a wonderful technology because Absolutely. there are many people who don't want to go under the knife. There are many mm -hmm. people who don't want to do injections. Right. Then I feel I love this treatment because it helps with texture. It helps with, you can infuse a lot of the good stuff into your skin. It helps with pigmentation, mm -hmm. uh, collagen neogenesis. So yeah. it's lovely. I think um, most people who are regular in my skin, in my in clinic have microneedling of some some form of the or the other 
So that's underrated. You can really do a lot with that. Overrated, I think, is um, overfilled faces. Yeah. That is <laughs> fillers are overrated. They're great. I love fillers. Uh, yet, uh, it's like it's it's the hands that are very important. Yes. Who's doing your treatment? Mm -hmm. As doctors, it's our responsibility to tell our patient, stop. Many mm -hmm. a time, the patient will keep telling you, no, doc, I need some more. Mm -hmm. You should just tell them, stop, because um, some of the not-so-nice-looking people are becoming very bad ad advocates for our uh, profession. Yeah, profession. And I don't want to look mm -hmm. like XYZ, including right. people from Hollywood. They'll yeah. bring, See, she used to look like this, now she looks like that. So. Right, right. So That's you don't know the their way. journey, you know, their preferences, their journey, what are uh, they, you know. So that should not be there, I guess. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, one last question. that um, If uh, a new, uh, if someone who is beginning their career as a practitioner in aesthetics, what would yeah. be your advice to them? Would Yeah, so aesthetics is a wonderful field. What I feel is... Um, Ensure that you're getting all the knowledge first. So don't get in a hurry to start a practice. I feel you spend more time in educating yourself because there is no stipulated course where you can learn. So you have to pick up bits and pieces, attend some conferences, um, do some courses. That's one. Second is it's, it's nice to work with somebody who's already in the field yeah. so that you understand uh, the nuances of doing a practice. Right. Because sometimes Very true. you may be excellent with your uh, skill. Skill. You Maybe wow with anatomy. You may know everything. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to deal with patients. It's a different, total different ball game. You know? Exactly. Often, Very true. Like, you must have done a fantastic treatment, but the patient is just not convinced. Yeah. Because a lot of uh, it goes into how you consult with your patient. Yeah. Um, that is very important. Secondly is my very strong advice is don't do an injectable treatment the first time you see a patient. Exactly. Very true. That is something I totally agree. Don't be afraid if they don't want, you know, if they will go to somebody else, let them go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It will win you a lot of confidence with your mm -hmm. patient because they understand you're not in a hurry to uh, yes. just yeah, inject and get away with yeah. get the money back. Um, because aesthetics is a very long-term relation. If you're doing good, you will have a pool of patients who are happy to keep coming back to you. Yes, yes. And if you're losing your existing patients, that means there is something which you're not doing right. Which you're not doing right. Exactly. That self-analysis is very important. And yeah. uh, very true. Very rightly said. That was golden. And second, don't stop learning. You know, mm -hmm. irrespective of how many years you're into the practice, you have to keep improving. So my husband always says, you know, the motto should be that I'm going to improve myself 1% every day. Every day. Absolutely. And I think that is really good. It doesn't matter how old you are or what you're doing or what field of life you are in. Uh, that motivation is essential. And there will be good days. There will be bad days. Yes. You should have done something, you know, some good learning that day. Whether you had enough patience or you didn't, you know, yes. you had a complication you had to handle. It doesn't matter. As long as you are doing something, uh, improving yourself, you know, professionally, personally, whatever. Absolutely. Wonderful. <laughs> so it was lovely having you here and uh, hearing from you the insights that you gave. And I, I'm really thankful to you for your time. So thank you and take care and good day. Yeah. Thanks for having me and hope to see you soon. Sure. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye.